Let's go. Let's roll. Uh. Hi guys, it's Alex. Today I'll talk with a brilliant person, Liz Parrish, about modern longevity technologies and trends. Liz is a founder and CEO of BioViva Science USA. BioViva is committed to extend healthy lifespan by using genetic therapy. Liz elongated 30 telomeres and well known as a woman who wants to genetically engineer you. Also, Liz, entrepreneur, innovator, author, educational podcast host, leading voice for genetic engineering, and just a nice person. The link on uh, her company will be below the video in the description section. And now my conversation with Liz. Liz, hi Liz. Uh, so happy to see you again on my show. Welcome. I am so happy to see you too. We do this about once a year, it seems like, and I'm always happy to catch up with you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Let's go. Uh, Let's go. Offshore medical tourism, uh, offshore medical service, and offshore um, uh, clinical trials. Uh, why uh, it is important, why we need it at this stage of the development of uh, medical system and service. Right. So when a lot of people think of medical tourism, they think of um, maybe illegal activity. Uh, which is not the case. Uh, before COVID, about 80% of clinical trials, even from the biggest companies in the world, even from pharma, were done offshore. So offshore uh, clinical trials are really important because they drive down the cost of a clinical trial and they help new groups access technology. Uh, why they're done uh, lower level than regulatory system is because the regulatory requirements for innovative med medicine are vastly too high. So you will see a rise in what's called investigator led studies, which are also legal studies to do. They're not clinical trials underneath a government, but they are legal consensual use of medicine between patients and doctors. And the reason that this is on the rise, exponentially on the rise, is because innovative medicine is not getting into clinical trials. There is something called the valley of death for biotech companies, and this is the between discovery and a phase one clinical trial. Companies don't have the money to produce millions of dollars, sometimes tens of millions of dollars of required research that um, is required in order to get into a clinical trial. New medicine is more precise than ever. It has less side effects than ever. So therefore the requirements that are uh, put in demand by regulatory systems are generally um, overdone for this new type of medicine. And so uh, companies and patients, mo most likely patients, they are the ones that pressure uh, companies and medical doctors to use new medicine are, are forced offshore to do these investigator-led studies. So um, the reason that medical tourism is so expensive is because we need access to less expensive medicine and patients are dying. So you know, this year alone, just aging associated diseases, what my company BioViva works on, over 41 million people will die. And um, risk aversion is vastly driving these deaths. And so people are moving to medical tourism to find uh, treatments. And this happened years ago in stem cells. Um, people started going offshore to get stem cell treatments because they were dying while regulators were moving too slowly. Uh, okay, uh, Liz, uh, am I understood you correctly that uh, uh, legally you can't uh, use uh, genetic therapy uh, to cure pe people on the U.S. Uh, territory? Yeah, well, you know, you could probably um, do something if a doctor insisted on using a technology as long as you um, go by certain protocols, but it's so risky for everyone involved that most people would never uh, attempt to do anything uh, in gene therapy inside the U.S. 
that didn't go along with U.S. regulations. Even my company is right now, we're working on our pre-INDs to try to meet the requirements of the U.S. FDA, which we think is essential to make drugs for the entire world. So, um, you know, my company can't uh, participate in medical tourism because we are a U.S. company, but we are doing everything that we can do to work within the regulatory system to get dr access to um, patients who need the treatments. But God blessed Mexico. <laughs> uh, no, so this, uh, 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 how much uh, does it cost to go through all three uh, clinical trial uh, phases and uh, to issue new medicine on the market? Yeah, so it was estimated in a paper by Tufts University a couple of years ago that it cost $2.8 billion uh, to get one drug uh, out on the market. And as you know, um, gene therapies right now are the most expensive drugs on the market, the regulated ones, uh, because they are for rare diseases. And so there, there's not one gene therapy that's accessible to a market that's sizable enough to bring the cost of the therapies down. So, you know, this causes a real problem. Um, do you know any uh, biotech company that has $2.8 billion to get a drug approved? Uh, no, you don't. And yet there are many uh, bad drugs on the market that have gone through that approval because companies have been able to afford it. And um, they have had a net negative effect on some of the population. So, you know, I think that it's important uh, that we realize that the cost of a process does not make a safe drug, that all drugs are experimental and that we need new routes for terminally ill patients to get access to uh, cutting edge and innovative medicine. Uh, and Liz, uh, I know you did study uh, how aging affects on the economy. So, uh, Liz, uh, how much uh, does aging cost for the economy? Yeah, well, actually, there's a great study that I think David Sinclair was part of. And just for the U.S. alone, it's trillions of dollars a year. Um, and the savings to slow aging by one year, just for the U.S. alone, and that's very U.S. centric, but that was what the most recent study was done on, is trillions of dollars saving. I think it was about $38 trillion a year just to slow aging by a year. So that, that's, that's really, that's, that should be really, uh, powerful information uh, right there. So if you if you want to put a dollar amount on a human's life uh, there, now you have it. Um, I'm always surprised why people need a dollar amount put on a human's life. And I'm very concerned that in this time in history, we have stopped valuing uh, human life and we have valued the dollar <laughs> over it and i think that that's really sad um if you if if you saved no money uh by saving a human life it seems to me that that would be important but when we're talking on the government level we actually have to talk about human lives equaling dollars and cents there's something uh, radically missing from our thought process here uh yeah uh, entirely agree with you uh, Liz, uh, additionally to uh, to offshore medical tourism, uh, do you have the game plan how to force authorities and uh, governments uh, to to change their uh, regulatory system and uh, really be on the people side that people have access to new medicine? Yeah, I, I think that one thing that we do is we vastly underestimate a patient's uh, ability to understand. So one of the ways that risk averse um, regulatory systems try to scare people is they say that patients are being taken advantage of 
with experimental medicine. But these patients generally are the, the most intelligent and educated people in their disease state. They are not um, ignorant, they are not uh, stupid, and they shouldn't be treated as such. Uh, I have worked for years now in the regulatory space to try to build something in which we can all agree on is a safer path to use innovative medicine. And so I've come up with a plan called Best Choice Medicine, in which would give the U.S. or any other country in the world the ability to create a pre-route to the regulatory system that gives terminally ill patients access to new and innovative gene therapies in order to de-risk the US FDA. I'm not in a battle with the US FDA. I wanna actually help and assist them. I understand their pain points. One of their pain points, one of the biggest pain points is that biotech companies are required to get animal data, uh, millions of dollars of animal data of uh, safety is fine, but efficacy is, is, is on the route of out of bounds because how a drug performs in an an, a mouse, a rat, or a dog, or a cat is very different than how it might perform in a human. So by having an early pre-regulatory route, the US FDA would literally just be determining access on human data, which would vastly de-risk their system and help them expedite uh, curative medicine to humans. Uh, Liz, uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, animal data, but le let me ask you again. Are results of the uh, clinical trials on uh, mice and other animals uh, transferable to human beings or not? They are, it's very difficult because there are drugs that go to humans that turn out to be dangerous uh, that went through animal studies. There are also drugs that work in humans like uh, penicillin and aspirin that might have killed small animals and never made it to humans if they were required at the time, if those studies were required at the time. So uh, we could say that it gives us some idea, uh, but it's not a 100% guarantee. So whether you do medical tourism or you do a pre-regulatory route, to a clinical trial or you do a clinical trial, you are participating in an experiment of the same magnitude. And even in many cases, because precision medicine for each human isn't a thing yet, you are still participating in an experiment even with a regulated drug. And that's why you see you know, over 100,000 adverse drug reactions a year in the United States alone and many deaths from taking prescribed medicine that unfortunately for some people um, could be toxic. And so as we move towards precision medicine, um, we will see less and less negative outcomes, but we are not there yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you know, uh, uh, some uh, Irish people will say, uh, will say something like that. What clinical trials on human beings? What, what, what uh, can you say for these people? How safety is that? Um, so in clinical trials, so, you know, I mean, in clinical trials, even a government sanctioned clinical trial, you're not necessarily participating in something that's safe. Uh, certainly, that's what phase one is for, is to show that there is a general amount of safety to a drug. And then phase two is to show that there's efficacy. I believe that regulatory systems should actually be uh, pinning those two together, safety and efficacy as one trial trial in order to expedite uh, the use of drugs. There's probably no drug on the planet that will be safe for everyone on the planet. So you're always looking for a drug that is safe for the majority of people or people in the highest need. The difference with the uh, gene therapies and the regenerative gene therapies is hopefully they will be beneficial to most people and help people stay healthier longer. But um, Everything that we participate in in the world has some amount of risk. 
And so we have to overcome the fear of that risk in order to make sure that people are living longer through innovative medicine rather than not. I do believe that the blocking and the risk aversion of new medicine is leading to the death of more people um, than it's saving. I don't think that it's okay to say, we don't have a treatment that's uh, approved yet for your disease, so we're going to let you die rather than using experimental medicine that in animal models or elsewhere has shown efficacy or, or some amount of benefit. I think that we should be doing everything we can to help these patients. And I think that if we don't, that should be what becomes illegal. Uh, Lisa, uh, what is uh, yours uh, helping uh, patients tomorrow by helping patients today? Yeah, so that's best choice medicine. So that's my uh, new regulatory plan to help governments anywhere in the world start to use gene therapies and create uh, early access routes so that they can lead in the innovation of human data. So the most important thing is that we're helping patients, helping them get access to technology and finding curative medicine as soon as possible so that we can leave our children with a world in which we do not continue to die of the same diseases that we do today. Uh, this uh, platform uh, also can help uh, innovators to launch their own genetic therapy at their home countries. Uh, am I right? Or, yeah, or it not? would help. It would help every country in the world um, get an innovative lead in accessing new technologies, launching their own local biotech uh, technology companies, and it and it basically is is built with an oversight, a scientific oversight, to ensure that riskier drugs are removed from the process and certain things like, you know, uh, editing of embryos and germline editing are discluded from uh, the legal aspects of the new route. So it would all be based around curative medicine, diseases in which have no treatment already and aging associated diseases because they don't have a curative treatment. And um, it would be overseen by a um, international review board who would assess the risk of the technology before people get access. Uh, Liz, uh, tell me please about multi-combinatory genes delivery system. Right, so we're working at BioViva on building better gene therapy delivery systems. And so we started with AAV, uh, which can deliver small payloads. And then we started developing a new delivery system called CMV to help gene therapy companies all around the world who are trying to deliver larger payloads. <laughs> They want to do it with a non-integrating uh, delivery method that has long-term long sustained um, protein distribution, and they want something that's redosable. And so that's what we've been spending uh, our time at BioViva working on for the last several years. Uh, Liz, uh, usually uh, gene uh, therapy companies use uh, adenovirus to cure people. Uh, you and your company decided to use uh, cytomegalovirus. Mm -hmm. uh, why? What's the advantages of cytomegalovirus compared with uh, adenovirus? Right. So we, we used um, uh, just a little um, clarification, adeno-associated virus. So we use the adeno-associated virus. We have oh, a patent okay. around it. We have some pending patents around it. So it's a great place to start. But we're using cytomegalovirus now because it has a larger capacity. Um, it has the promise of getting up to 10 times more of the capacity into it. It evades the immune system, uh, which is super beneficial, and it appears to be redosable. And that's important because with AAV, we have a real problem uh, with redosing. And we believe that AAV gene therapies uh, probably will only last for five to seven years. Um, if they're edited in, they'll probably last longer. But our worry is that patients will need retreatment. And so we wanted to solve this problem of 
redosable gene therapy. Um, the great thing about uh, cytomegalovirus, unlike uh, some of the liposome deliveries, is that it delivers the genetic material to the nucleus without integrating. And um, when you do that, you get long-term sustained uh, production. We worked on both uh, intra uh, injected and intranasal delivery, um, hoping that in the future you'll be able to just spray your gene therapy into your nose and wow. uh, have beneficial systematic effect. So we can actually make take a, a, a procedure that needs to be done in a medical facility uh, right to your home so that you can administer your own gene therapy. And that's a very future facing statement wow. because a lot of things that we'll need to work around to make that happen safely in the environment of your home. But uh, we're really excited about it. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. Um, uh, could you tell me about your new study, uh, new breakthrough paper, its collaboration of authors from uh, famous medical schools and universities like Howard, New Jersey Medical School, uh, including Ulysses? Right, so um, our paper on cytomegalovirus as a delivery method came out in PNAS, I think last year. Uh, I mean, we worked on it for years and it's funny because the publication, when it's done, finished and then when it goes through peer review and publication is very different. So I believe we were finished in 2021, but then it was published in 2022. And um, uh, George Church from uh, Harvard uh, is on that paper. He's also a co-founder of BioViva. Um, Rutgers University was uh, instrumental. Dr. Hua Zhu's lab uh, was the lab that, that we have been working for, for, working with for years, and we're still working with them. Now we're doing the, the human vector design. And uh, Dabu uh, Zhaijin uh, was the lead investigator. And so it was it was a really fantastic team. And we're, we're super excited about moving the technology forward. And uh, uh, let me ask you, uh, and something maybe on the pipeline here. Oh, yeah. So when, in that paper, we used both telomerase reverse transcriptase and folistatin. We used them in separate arms and we showed that folistatin could be redosed and increase the lifespan by over 31 percent of the mice, the life and health span. And then in telomerase reverse transcriptase, uh, we showed that it could be redosed and it um, increased the lifespan of the mice of over 40 percent which is fantastic. And, and uh, not only that, um, they lived healthier and better. And um, I mean, just by, by every uh, mark, their glucose, blood glucose was better controlled. Um, their body mass was better sustained. Their appearance was uh, better. Uh, you know, this is hopefully uh, translatable to humans. And, and what it would mean uh, to a human if it translated 100% um, is that if you were a person who might die in your late 70s or early 80s, you might go on to live a very healthy life and live to be over 110. So um, that that's a good start for regenerative medicine and gene therapy, uh, which would buy us time to solve bigger problems around the aging space. Uh, and this, uh, what did you do to enhance your cognitive functions? Some injections? Yeah, so um, I, in 2020, I took uh, some more gene therapies and, and uh, two of the gene therapies that I took um, were telomerase reverse transcriptase and clotho, and I took them intranasally. And that's that's different than the mouse study. The, what we're doing with CMV is literally an intranasal spray. With AAV, you can't do that. Uh, you would just basically get no effect. So we have a proprietary way of in, injecting um, uh, the gene therapy with an adjuvant that, that helps it um, basically cross the blood brain barrier. And so uh, those were the gene therapies that I took uh, for cognitive enhancement. And I hope it worked. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Liz, uh, people ask me uh, to ask you, uh, majority of them are women. Uh, they say, 
Uh, I can't afford uh, generic therapy at this moment. Uh, Alex, please uh, ask Liz about her sport lifestyle, about her, what, what exercises does uh, she do, and about her nutrition, and uh, what uh, supplements does she take? Oh, those are those are good questions, because really, um, if you're a generally healthy person and, and healthy, have healthy aging happening in your life, the, the best thing you can do is diet and exercise. And for years, I wasn't very good at that. But I have recently decided to go out and try to maximize my gene therapies. And so uh, you should know that probably for 30 years, I've been a vegetarian. Um, several of my meals are vegan. Um, I do believe that we are an overfed um, society, um, but, you know, we're pretty addicted to sugar. And so recently I've really cut out sugar and I have lost weight. Um, I have um, increased my um, protein and nutrition in general outside of sugar. And I'm starting to put on more muscle mass again. That's great. Um, I think moderate exercise is, in, is important. And so, you know, 15 minutes a day, try to, try to get out there and sweat a little, work on different muscle groups every day, just for a few minutes. Look, it's not going to hurt you. Do it while you watch TV, you know, in, inspire yourself to do it. I'm playing soccer again on Fridays. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm a benefit or a detriment to my soccer team. I, I get, go out there a little too gung ho. Um, let's see, um, you know, so moderate exercise is really important. Uh, your, your diet is the most important, uh, get it, get away from the sugars. They're, they're driving aging They're mm. They, they will feed cancer cells. Uh, it does a lot of bad things and just doing that, uh, you will, uh, become a lot healthier as far as supplements. Uh, because I'm a vegetarian, I do take B12 uh, at least a couple times a week. I'm not very good at supplements. That's why I'm a big proponent of gene therapy. I'd rather uh, take an injection and forget it, but you do need nutrition. Um, so sometimes I take melatonin at night uh, to help me sleep. Um, omega. Uh, omega. Omega. Are important I take those a few times a week probably you should take them every day I understand that everyone's de deficient in magnesium but you should talk to your doctor first about what type you need because there are several different types and they're they're good for different things um, so again I'm not I'm not a specialist in nutrition I am becoming better at it I'm becoming very interested because it really is the way to get the most amount of healthy years out of your life without doing major interventions like gene therapy. So, and, and that's still experimental, so we can't make any claims around that. So yes, try to, don't overfeed yourself, stay away from sugar, try to eat you know, healthy and whole foods uh, when you can, and, um, and take a multivitamin. Make sure that you're taking something, you know, a lot of people assume that because civilizations today are overfed that we have everything that we need nutritionally and i think that often uh, that isn't the case but don't overdo your vitamins because that can be toxic to your body as well overdoing antioxidants be can become really harmful so be moderate be realistic uh, but make sure that you're meeting all your needs go to your doctor and get your blood run and see if you're deficient in anything and also, you know, taking allergy tests is probably a good idea to make sure that you're not eating something that's driving chronic inflammation in your body. So I'm learning as we go. I'm also um, learning about and I'm going to become interested in the next year or two in hormone replacement. This was something that I didn't think anything of until I was at a recent conference and I found out that people even in their 30s are doing ho hormone replacement and having like all of these super benefits that I didn't even think that people um, in their 30s needed. So I'm going to look into it. I'm going to research it and see if it's a viable option for myself or other people because optimizing everything is, is important. 
Uh, but I wouldn't do anything um, on the uh, diet, exercise, and uh, hormones that your doctor doesn't suggest. So talk to your doctor yeah. and, uh, you know, make sure that you have uh, general oversight. Yeah, and uh, technologies always have deflation process, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, uh, Liz, and uh, I'd like uh, to get some inside information from you about George Church. I'm not familiar with him, at least at this moment. Is he extremely ambitious uh, person, visionary, go big or go home? He's amazing. Um, <laughs> we, I mean, the, the thing is, is that George Church has the highest education in in the entire realm of genetics and innovation. And he is not incredibly risk adverse. So a lot of people, when they get into these positions of, you know, having a, a a standing in higher education or being the lead of a company that is becomes really important or something like that, they become risk averse. And he's not risk averse because he understands that the risk aversion will lead to he and everyone else dying uh, without using technology. I think that he's the perfect balance. I mean, he's not risky, I don't think, but he's not risk averse. He realized that we have this technology and we need to use it for the good of humans. And um, that continuing to extend the lifespan of mice has very little uh, to no use for humans when we just continue to do it over and over again without helping people who need it. Uh, Liz, uh, and uh, in the end of our conversation, it will be a deadly sin from my side if I don't say you that you are dazzling and have a great style in everything. Thank you so much. I, I look forward to talking to you uh, every year and we should talk more often. But thank you. That that is a, that is a huge compliment. I appreciate it. Yeah! <laughs> Liz, and your favorite. <laughs> and your favorite. Faster, smarter, stronger. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you for having me.